Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to today's webinar, The Notorious MUTCD, Why Fixing a Federal Manual is Critical to Safety, Equity, and Climate. I'm Kelsey Card, Communications Manager for America Walks, and I'm joined here with America Walks' Executive Director, Mike McGinn. Mike will be moderating and guiding the conversation today, and I will tee up our presentations and we'll be running the technical details behind the scenes as well. So first off, we wanna just thank all of you who attend these webinars and have donated to make sure this program and our other programs continue to thrive. These are programs that allow us to directly support local grassroots activism at the neighborhood level. So if you do like this content and you're a regular guest here, we really encourage you to think about making a donation that ultimately supports that kind of work. And a quick note about the technology today. So you should see a control panel just like this on your screen. That's where I will be looking for your questions for our panelists today. And after the presentations, we'll kick off a Q&A session. So please enter any questions that come to mind right there. And if you'd like to use our closed captioning today, the link for that is also in the chat box there. Our presenters today are Dong Ho Chang, City Traffic Engineer for Seattle. He's worked over 29 years in the transportation engineering field, focused on improving safety and mobility for all travel modes. Zabe Bent, Director of Design at National Association of City Transportation Officials, also known as NACTO, and has 20 years of experience in multimodal planning and urban development. Matthew Rowe, Technical Lead at NACTO, he is an urban transportation planner with a decade of experience in planning and implementing great streets. And Lisa Marie Glover, Transportation Division Manager at City of Fort Lauderdale. Lisa has more than 15 years of experience around transportation infrastructure, legislative research, and transit planning and management. And Benjamin Restrepo, Senior Project Manager at City of Fort Lauderdale. Benjamin reviews site plans to identify conflicts and opportunities and addresses traffic impacts. And he's been working in the field of engineering for more than nine years. So we have some serious wisdom packed onto this panel today. Thank you all so much for being here. So today's webinar is really focused on the Notorious Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. This document dictates the design of every street in the US from crosswalks to speed limits, bike lanes, and more. And right now it is up for revision. So the proposed draft, though, continues to prioritize moving cars fast over safe, safety, equity, accessibility, and climate. So USDOT Secretary Pete Buttigieg is facing a very early test of his commitment to reform. And we are all wondering, will he make the call to reframe and rewrite this manual so that it aligns with what he says he wants to do? So today, our amazing panel will speak to the nuances and stories of why the MUTCD matters, what's wrong with it, what needs to be done next, and how you can help make a difference. So again, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn things over now to Zabe and we will get started. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us and thanks to America Walks for hosting us. I'm Zabe Bent again with NACTO. Next slide, please. And uh, we'll just give a few moments of, next slide, thanks, of um, our, a little framing around the MUTCD. Um, first, as uh, if you've heard, it's um, a document that covers signs, signals, and markings. Um, but of course, because of this, it has a pretty big impact on many, many other things that govern street design, um, from speed limits to crosswalk materials, bike weights, et cetera. Um, and it's the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, what we wanna spend a little bit of time on is what's wrong with the current draft. Uh, there is a draft that's available now for comment. And we wanted to spend a little bit of time just explaining um, what the, the comments look like and why we're calling for a reframe. Um, right now, because of the focus on uh, car traffic, 
and um, the sort of dominance of uh, sort of car centric planning um, it results in lengthy process um, lengthy timeline and even additional costs for key safety and access measures and um, what that means is it essentially perpetuates an existing double standard between modes and that is sort of an inherent inequity that we see uh, the other thing that I think is really important to, to flag is that it's written as technical guidance and it because it's written as technical guidance it's seen as this thing that's sort of um, it's taken as, as law as almost as a bible by folks in our industry and this is the moment where I say some of my best friends are engineers um, but essentially it puts us in, in a situation where we are perpetually asking engineers um, in Seoul to really reframe what our streets do for mobility, for accessibility, um, not just for cars and for highway design, but also for all of the purposes that we use our streets for, um, whether you're a pedestrian or a transit rider or a cyclist or a driver. Um, what we're doing right now, uh, not just NACTO, but several other partner organizations are calling to reframe the current draft. Um, we want to see a substantive alignment with the goals that the administration has set forth of safety, sustainability, and equity, and to focus on the core elements of, of what the, the document is meant to achieve. Um, we are, however, also collating detailed comments from our member cities um, at NACTO, which there are over 80 in the US. Um, and we're going through section by section to review the current draft and also um, going through detailed suggestions for changes. And what this essentially means is we're, we're seeking a, a new document that is really seen as proactive safety guidance for all road users, and that it incorporates multidisciplinary stakeholder collaboration. We, we wanna make sure that it's not just engineers writing this document, but that it's also urban planners, it's uh, urban designers, and basically everyone who uses the street has an opportunity to to weigh in because it puts our designers and an engineers in a situation where they're sincerely responsible for everything on their own and no document that's written by any one sector could ever be seen as sort of promoting all of these different goals and particularly equity and with that i'll turn it over to matthew to go through a lot more detail of what some of the, the key issues are and then join you back for the discussion. Um, thanks, Abe. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Rowe. Again, I'm the technical lead at NACTO, um, and I've got a very short story to tell about cities and problem solving and the METCD and how they can work together, um, but only when uh, there's really a uh, really a view toward problem solving and flexibility. Um, so back. Uh, Soon after I uh, started uh, my uh, first job at New York City DOT, um, cities around the country and then after that around the world started to say, okay, well, we've got this roadway space that we wanna repurpose. Um, we need to make it pedestrian friendly space. So how are we going to do that? Well, the METCD says you can use a double white line um, to say cars are prohibited from crossing motor vehicles, can't cross the double white line. Um, so cities got comfortable creating pedestrian space on the roadway um, using that technique, fully METCD compliant, meant designed from the beginning to work within existing regulations because we knew those regs wouldn't change quickly. Um, NACTO took that, uh, took that practice and, um, and formalized it, put it into our uh, urban street design guide, which many of you are familiar with. Um, and now we have a, a small cause for celebration. Uh, even though these were always compliant, uh, they weren't in the guide, and so a lot of cities, a lot of um, a lot of states, uh, especially when um, two jurisdictions—a city and a state, or a city and a county, or a county and a state—wanted to work together uh, to create uh, something like this, there was certainly some hesitation. Um, they just didn't quite know um, whether it was okay because it wasn't in the manual. Um, so we have some celebrate some things to celebrate here, but even though. Uh, the features on the right, using painted islands in between a uh, bike lane and a motor vehicle lane, or um, uh, shortening the crosswalk by having it end at the double white line instead of going all the way through the way it's shown on the left and in the METCD. Um, even though those are allowed, uh, they're not illustrated yet. So it's an easy thing for FHWA to fix, and we certainly hope they will. But the reason I bring it up is that this is an example where um, the, uh, the problem was clear, 
uh, it was solved. Um, it was resolved in a way that um, really didn't require um, uh, much of a change um, on the part of the regulation. And the MUTCD is a regulation, um, and that's one of the challenges with it. Um, but uh, but it wasn't resolved fully, right? It, the uh, the guidance and the kind of permission slip that we're looking for, the support and backing that we're looking for as cities, um, isn't fully there yet. Uh, that interplay between the um, uh, between uh, modes and between the professions also comes up when we look at the way that um, easy pass lanes and electronic toll collection lanes or formal name are treated in the manual uh, versus how transit lanes are expected to be treated in the manual. Um, back in 2006, 2007, uh, a number of cities started to implement red transit lanes in the United States. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of them now. They've been demonstrated to work, but the proposed manual would still saddle every project with uh, a new engineering study, unspecified. Um, so that just kind of opens up cities to push back. It opens up cities to a state saying, well, you didn't necessarily do the engineering study the way we wanted to. It adds delay in cost um, and veto points for projects that really need um, as much support as they can. Um, and even a little bit more, um, uh, even a little more uh, gallingly, um, the, um, uh, the proposal would say, well, you can do pretty much whatever you want with purple. You use a purple stripe. You can put it behind the words at a toll plaza, but you can't do any of the stuff on the right um, with red, even if, you know, as in the picture on the right, you've got a, um, a really good reason not to try to mark red across an entire uh, rail line. So that's an example where we think, you know, there was a really good intent and it's great to see red transit lanes in the draft of the manual, but it hasn't, it just hasn't gotten to the point where it would actually make it easier might actually make it a little harder for some cities. The other thing that we hear about the MUTCD is that it's not a geometric design guide. And it's not meant to be. Um, and it's certainly not meant to be comprehensive about that. But it is often referred to as one. And there are clauses that prohibit some kinds of designs um, and actually encourage other kinds of designs. What you see on the screen here is a kind of infrastructure, bike bike infrastructure, bike lanes that most people wouldn't be comfortable using. Um, it's a type of intersection most pedestrians wouldn't be comfortable crossing either. I certainly wouldn't be. Um, and uh, the issue is that we've made this the, the standard, the, the, the typical um, nationwide. Um, the MHCD uh, has essentially doubled down on that, on this as a typical type of infrastructure. Um, and you sometimes end up with as much as 400 feet before, uh, between when the MEGCD says, well, you have to drop the bike lane before the right turn lane. Um, and you end up with a situation that doesn't really serve anyone well. Um, you notice that the person on a bike is actually up on the sidewalk. He, doesn't, he didn't want to be in that four foot wide marked lane between two 40 mile or 50 mile per hour uh, car lanes. Um, this is a lingering effect of an old and pretty narrow ideology of vehicular cycling. I'm not going to get into that in detail, but it does mean that there's a fear of bike infrastructure embedded into the MUTCD, um, and that makes it hard to change things over time. So one of the differences between the uh, some of the things that are uh, not uh, going to be uh, not proposed to be allowed, and some of the things that are proposed to be allowed, is that the ones that are not the ones that are proposed to be prohibited kind of uh, build on older restrictions. And the ones that are proposed to be allowed are actually based on older flexibility. It was already there. It's very hard for FHWA to make that kind of change. And that's why it really concerns us that there are a lot of prohibitions, new prohibitions um, in the manual. Um, there are a lot of them, especially in the section pertaining to bicycle infrastructure, um, which means that it's going to be harder to make the kinds of urban streets that we want. Um, the, um, the, the kinds of streets that are actually safe and comfortable to bike and walk and play on and take transit on. Um, almost everything on the left would be prohibited. Um, the, uh, the bike symbol on that sign that's just helpful for telling people um, that that's a, a street that's good for biking on. Um, the, uh, the minute, the one minute um, time uh, marker. Uh, to tell people, reassure people, yeah, it's really not that far that you're trying to go, um, because there's research showing that it's uh, it's really hard to know how far, uh, how long it'll take you to go by bike. And by the way, that nice little 
you know, even if a sharrow isn't the perfect type of bike infrastructure, um, when you do have a, a situation with cars sharing the same spaces um, as people on bikes, you know, I would certainly want the drivers to see uh, the boldest thing possible, but that would be prohibited. That green would be prohibited. So those new restrictions are very concerning. Um, and sometimes it's because there isn't research to back up allowing something, but sometimes even when there is research that supports allowing something that supports the idea that it might be better and reasoning that supports the idea that it might be better, we still find those things restricted. So the the um, the yield to pedestrian or stop for pedestrian state law, stop for pedestrian and crosswalk sign, um, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, that'd be allowed, it'd still be allowed on a double yellow line. But the situation on the right, where it's between two lanes on this multi-lane street, wouldn't be allowed. Now, why? Well, maybe it's because those are actually the streets where they're needed the most, right? So there's a certain fear of installing anything. Um, there's a fear of allowing anything that might encourage people to actually cross the street. Um, and that runs through the document. There's actually specific uh, wording, uh, cautioning against, um, cautioning against uh, just using crosswalks all over the place. Um, sometimes the restrictions or the the lack of support in the manual, or you know, can be a little bit, uh, a little bit comical, right? Um, all of these um, large animal crossing signs are available. I certainly don't know how to behave differently when I see a bighorn sheep than when I see a regular sheep. Um, but the sign on the right, uh, which many cities and states have used for years wouldn't be allowed because you'd have to actually write the word bicycles. It's trivial in a sense, um, but some of those restrictions are, are quite insulting. Um, uh, FHWA went out of its way to allow what's on the left and out of its way to prohibit um, the Rainbow Crosswalk and other community crosswalks on the right. So what's the point of that? Why? Um, well, uh, FHWA is seeking uniformity. Um, the MHECD as a document is based on the idea of uniformity, but that idea is that if we make every sign, signal, and marking in the United States look the same, it'll be easier for drivers to go fast. And that idea that the amount of time that it takes to actually figure out what to do, that bringing that down is always a good thing, that idea is really directly tied to the idea that the purpose of the street or the road is just to move uh, as many cars as possible as quickly as possible without them stopping. And so you see the word safety and efficiency in the manual. And unfortunately, that phrase, when it's used together in traffic engineering, we have to be very careful because when we see that phrase, it usually means can we avoid making drivers stop or slow down? Right? Can we promote high speed movement without conflicts that might cause a serious crash for a vehicle occupant? The problem with that is pretty clear. It should be pretty clear to all of us. It leaves out all the rest of us whenever we're not in the driver's seat of a car. Um, so the two areas that are, in a sense, the, the deepest expressions of this are the idea of the 85th percentile speed, and that that uh, has been used for quite a long time as a way to set speed limits. Uh, the MEGCD walks, walks that back a little bit, but it still recommends it for, um, for highways, and it still recommends using it for all streets. It still recommends considering that speed. So you're sort of supposed to now consider the speeding drivers and also the kids on the street and the people crossing the street and people biking on the street and the transit riders. Um, it doesn't restrict anyone from putting in lower speed limits, but it does discourage them. And then finally, and probably most egregiously, and this is what you're going to hear the most about, um, I think from some of our uh, subsequent speakers, the signal warrants in the MUTCD remain very circular. Um, it, they instruct us as transportation practitioners. I'm a transportation planner, instructs me when I was working uh, for a city. It instructed me to not try to put in signals, instructed us as an agency not to put in signals until people had been hurt. Um, it, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bar is now set at four injuries or deaths in three years. It seems like quite a high number. To me, in that uh, as soon as we can see an injury and observe a street, we often know that there's a real problem there, and often before um, tragedy happens, uh, we can intervene. Um, so the street on the left, unfortunately, is MUTCD compliant, best as I can tell, and would remain so. The only thing that the manual would require would be widening the markings on those lanes from four inches to six inches. Wouldn't really help these pedestrians. 
Um, it wouldn't help me cross that street. And honestly, it wouldn't help the drivers coming out across multiple lanes either. Um, this kind of hesitancy um, from, uh, from the MUTCD, uh, we might call it signal hesitancy, um, has really been detrimental and there are documented effects of what this means for people's lives, um, including, when, um, including when it's not even a matter of a restriction, just a matter of difficulty in knowing that it's the right thing to do. Um, you're going to hear now from uh, Dang Ho Chang, the Chief Traffic Engineer of the City of Seattle, um, who uh, is encyclopedic on these topics, and I believe will have some great things to share with you. Thanks. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining us for this really important topic. Um, I, I think we have done as a profession a really great job. We have a dedicated uh, a group of volunteers and also staff that's looking at safety of all of our roadways. And we've done an excellent job of um, uh, creating a roadway system that's really safe, efficient, and convenient. Um, for people traveling in vehicles. Um, but, you know, really um, those that are outside the vehicle are often um, uh, not addressed, um, they're excluded, and they're harmed. Um, and I think this is really apparent now with the age of COVID and as we are uh, utilizing our sidewalks and sometimes there is no sidewalks and how we have to navigate the uh, Uniform Vehicle Code, which is the rules of the road. Um, if there isn't a sidewalk, um, uh, you're to walk facing traffic. Uh, that's what the METCD kind of re uh, references. Um, and then upon uh, a, a approach of a vehicle, are supposed to step clear of the roadway. Um, and this family is walking on the portion of Aurora in North Seattle, uh, where um, you know they, sh they should be actually walking on the other side. Um, and that you know they uh, are uh, obviously uh, not in the best con uh, environment for um, uh, for people who are outside the vehicle. So really the context uh, is really important and we need to think about safe system approach uh, on our roadway design for not, not just vehicle drivers, but all users. Um, and really think about those we have uh, excluded. Um, an example of our uh, practice that really harms uh, is uh, how we treat uh, uh, all modes at an intersection uh, where we signalize the intersection and um, the rules of the road um, and the METCD says that uh, you know when that uh, pedestrian signal uh, uh, is looked at you know that's based on engineering judgment it's not always required it's not the de facto so we should change that say um, it should be required unless there is a, a rationale for removing it or not having it and um, at a location where uh, now we have technology to do countdown timers um, and uh, we are able to gauge when uh, we have sufficient time. Um, uh, the current uh, regulation on the MGT uh, says that you can step into the, the intersection when the walk signal is on, but as soon as the flashing don't walk uh, starts, you're not to step into the intersection, right? So um, uh, this is an intersection in uh, lower left uh, uh, University of Washington where the predominant mode is people walking. It's an all-way walk. Uh, why can't we have countdown timers starting at the start of walk? So we know exactly how much time a, uh, a majority of the mode have to cross the street. And if someone gauges and they have enough time to cross, why prevent that? Why make that illegal? Um, so again, I think we need to be really th think about uh, 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 the regulations that we put in place, and then who we uh, impact and exclude. Uh, um, Based on uh, uh, based on our uh, uh, on these guidance, uh, for example, uh, in Seattle, uh, African American represent seven percent of the Seattle's population, but they receive twenty six percent of the jaywalking tickets. Um, so uh, these laws and these regulations that we have uh, uh, impact people in uh, desperate uh, desperate ways. So uh, having that context uh, is really important. So um, um, uh, this is a uh, roadway uh, where uh, if you have uh, uh, high speed, uh, it really makes sense to have the guidance and the design uh, 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 
uh, for safe operation of, of the driver, right? So you want to have good, clear, uh, clear area for people to regain uh, if they lose control. Um, anything that's on the side of the roadway uh, should be break away so that uh, they don't have that high speed uh, uh, crash. Uh, um, but in the other context, in an urban area uh, where there are people, um, you don't want to have breakaway features. You don't have. You don't want to have clear zone. You want that vehicle to stop. And that uh, the really the place is really um, uh, for uh, pedestrians, right? So we need to make sure that uh, uh, vehicles stay in that roadway space and that they're not encroaching onto the pedestrian space. Um, and the METCD uh, provides guide guidance that uh, uh, sometimes does not help us um, uh, uh, design and operate our, uh, our, our streets in that context. METCD is adopted in Washington State by state law. Uh, we have to have a substantial conformance uh, of the METCD. There's a, uh, a, a group that uh, convenes to review and then makes modification, but they tend to be very small. And it applies to all uh, roadways and paths open to uh, the public, even private uh, roadways. So if you think about a, a private uh, uh, a property owner, uh, they have no clue on uh, what the METCD is, but they have to comply with it. And because it has a, uh, a force of law in Washington State, um, they have the responsibility to uh, to follow and have all the uh, uh, liabilities that uh, comes with it and responsibilities. And so um, having a process and providing an input that everyone can easily understand and why it's uh, uh, placed uh, the way that it is, is critical. Um, for example, I get asked questions from my uh, community on, oh, what are these hawk signals? And, you know, I don't see, I don't have a lot of these hawk signals. Um, and uh, if you think about the uniformity and safety, uh, hawk signal is very, again, it's, it's a tool that's available. It has research behind it, uh, but is it uniform? Is it easily understood? And uh, is that something that, that really has uh, safety benefits. Again, uh, we have a lot of uh, rail crossing in Seattle, uh, as, a, as many uh, communities. Uh, there's a, a possibility of misinterpretation, so we really need to be uh, thoughtful and understand how these decisions are made and how we uh, uh, can um, uh, direct our concerns to uh, people that can uh, make changes. Um, and with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Lisa Marie Glover uh, from City of Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale is experiencing a growing popularity and is transforming into a thriving metropolis. The development and redevelopment patterns are changing from suburban to urban with high density growth areas. As more people and businesses move to the area, there's a need to develop a balanced transportation network. Just to provide a quick overview of the layers of users of our network, Fort Lauderdale is home to Port Everglades, which is one of the top 10 busiest cruise ports in the world. We are also one of the South Florida's main seaports. The home, we're also the home of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport and the Intercontinental uh, Gateway uh, with over 700 flights to over 135 destinations. We are also the home of one of the top 10 boat shows in the world, which is the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show, which has dubbed us as the yachting capital of the world with 50,000 registered vessels and 100 marinas and boat yards. We are also known as the Venice of America with 165 miles of inland waterways, as well as a known South Florida vacation spot with over 560 hotels and nearly 36,000 hotel rooms. Now, add on top of that our transit, bicycle, and pedestrian dependent um, residents, residential traffic, local traffic, and residential users of our transportation network. Our vision here in Fort Lauderdale is to be a connected city with great streets and shared safety for all of our users. Now, it is important to remember, as stated earlier, 
The original goal of the MUTCD was to create national standards for the automobile traveler. Although deemed a recommendation guide, as Debbie has noted, it is used as a standard guide. It is the Bible and everyone refers to it in their ordinances, roadway design standards, etc. This becomes a barrier when looking at trying to promote designs which seek to improve equity, economic development, livability, and shared safety at the forefront of our streets. We believe that the reframing of the MUTCD will provide guidance for all modes to jointly share the roadway. Now I'm going to hand it over to our traffic engineer, Benjamin Restrepo. Hi everyone, uh, it's Benjamin Estrepo. I'm a uh, project manager here at the city of Fort Lauderdale. I'm gonna give two uh, examples of how uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale has ran into the MUTCD and uh, how it's impacted, uh, not just uh, the way people live in our city, but also some financial impacts on our roadway. So this first slide here is of Northeast 13th Street. Uh, Northeast 13th, this is a, a, an area of Fort Lauderdale that's about a, half a mile between Northeast 4th Avenue and the FEC train tracks. Uh, it's a city collector, four lane divided uh, with left turn lanes. Um, there's uh, no on-street parking, uh, thin sidewalks with some obstructions in the sidewalks. And the community has uh, called this little section of Fort Lauderdale, uh, Fort Lauderdale's little midtown. Uh, it's commercially zoned, surrounded by uh, residential uh, but instead of being used as a, a midtown gathering area, uh, drivers mainly use this stretch of corridor as a cut through from uh, East Fort Lauderdale to uh, West Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this is just a, a street view of Northeast 13th Street looking east. If you can kind of see it's the, the four lane divided highway with the two way left turn lane. Uh, there's not really much uh, economic growth happening here. Uh, you can see like for rent signs and um, Oh, and this picture was taken in 2011. Uh, here's another uh, a view of third, Northeast 13th Street on uh, Dixie Highway. Uh, not really much going on. It doesn't really make you want to feel like it's a sense of place or stop in to, uh, to purchase something. Uh, this next slide, I'm sure uh, most people know about uh, the memorandum from FHWA about the interim approval uh, for optional green colored pavement. Uh, this interim approval uh, was approved in 2011 with the condition that FHWA would approve the use if the jurisdiction submits a written request to the Office of Transportation Operations. Um, in 1984, the city of Fort Lauderdale and Broward County signed an interlocal agreement where the city granted jurisdictional control over all streets and highways uh, located within the city boundaries except for the, the state highway, of course. So what this means is uh, Broward County uh, is now the, the agency or the identity responsible for, for planning, uh, installation, operations, and uh, maintenance of traffic control devices on, on city roadways. So in 2017, uh, the city went out and uh, constructed this beautiful cross section on uh, Northeast 13th Street. Uh, it went from a, a four-lane divided collector to a two-lane divided roadway uh, with bike lanes and uh, on-street parking. Um, the reason why I kind of showed you the memo before was that uh, the city, uh, since it gave jurisdictional control to the county, uh, we couldn't uh, wait to get that uh, approval from FHWA or we couldn't wait for, for Broward County to apply for approval from FHWA. So uh, what ended up happening, happening because of the construction of this, uh, the city and county had to uh, amend the agreement from 1984. And uh, they would remove uh, this half mile stretch uh, from the agreement and then place in the monetary responsibility of maintaining the, the signing and payment markings and all traffic control devices back onto the city. Uh, so this is a, the, the slide of that intersection I kind of showed you before where the, the signals were. Uh, we ended up replacing the signals with uh, this, this roundabout. And um, with replacing the signals, now the city is responsible for all 
maintenance of, of this, this roundabout. So you can kind of see the before and afters. At the bottom left corner is uh, before the reconstruction project and uh, after uh, you can see on the top right corner. It's a big difference, a lot more accessibility for pedestrians, bicyclists, and, and even vehicular users. Um, there's more on-street parking for people to actually come in and stop and uh, spend their time here. Uh, again, the, the bottom left corner is before, the signalized intersection uh, to after. If you look at an aerial view of, of, of this segment, you can see the, the economic development that happened in this area, and just by all the new businesses that sprouted out just because of this uh, project that uh, the city constructed. Um, in 2018, after the project was constructed, the project construct was constructed in 2017, Broward County uh, eventually did apply for the interim use or the approval to use a uh, green uh, pavement uh, to signify a bicycle lane. So uh, after the project, maybe, maybe the county saw how great it was, so they decided, okay, let's go get the approval and let's start constructing this all over uh, the county. Uh, the next example is of a, uh, the next and final example is of Northeast 9th Street and Northeast 2nd Street. Uh, as I mentioned before, Broward County has the jurisdictional control to accept, to accept or deny the installation of uh, traffic control devices in our city. And uh, as they should, the Broward County uses the MUTCD to know when and where to install traffic control devices. Uh, at the time of installation, uh, this always stop control intersection did not meet the uh, warrants in the MUTCD. So uh, Broward County denied uh, the city's request to make this an always stop control intersection. So the city of Fort Lauderdale uh, felt it was imperative to move forward with the always stop control since this intersection does connect uh, a church and a, a, a high school. Um, and so you can just imagine during the peak season, uh, there's only one day out of the, the week that uh, people are not walking through this intersection and you need a certain amount of traffic control uh, besides crosswalk guards uh, to get, you know, not just uh, uh, children, but just anybody uh, through these intersections in all ways. Um, so, the, so in order to install this, you can kind of guess it's very similar to the previous project. Uh, the city and the county had to amend the 1984 agreement and uh, remove uh, this intersection from the agreement and then put all the responsibility and monetary uh, maintenance responsibility back on the city uh, to maintain. Uh, because the MUTCD's preferred treatment of, of vehicles and uh, pedestrians, it, it makes it more difficult for cities uh, like Fort Lauderdale uh, to make pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Uh, the burden uh, just isn't uh, about accessibility, but it's also monetary, since uh, cities like Fort Lauderdale uh, must make amendments to maintenance agreements and reallocate funds from one source uh, to now uh, maintaining uh, these traffic control devices. Uh, so that's kind of the, the stuff that we have to uh, evaluate going further when we want to try new, bold, innovative uh, projects. Uh, do we want to go and go for the grandiose projects, kind of like Northeast 13th Street? Uh, and if we do, then we have to make uh, amendments to our maintenance agreements and then have more financial burdens. So that's one of the things we would like to see corrected in the METC, just kind of put clear guidance on, on how we can allocate spaces in our roadways to our, uh, other multiple users in the river. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Benjamin, I think you need to turn off your presentation. And uh, get everyone into the conversation. Oh, there you are, you're popping up. Oh, me too. Here we go. Well, thanks everybody. And, uh, you know, I, if, if I can try to summarize what we heard so far was one, we prioritize cars over people. 
um, you know, whether that's uh, speed limits, whether it's crosswalks, whether it's uh, whether a barrier can be a solid barrier or not. Now we're now we're <laughs> prioritizing the damage to the car over damage to a person because we have something that'll break away for a vehicle and you know uh, as opposed to protect a person. Um, and Benjamin's story was just if you don't follow the MUTCD, you can lose dollars. So you 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 will do the unsafe thing to save money rather than the safe thing and have to put more money in. Um, how did we get here? This is my first question. I don't, I, I'm hopeful that we don't have, we, we can't possibly have everybody answer every question. But one of the things that was mentioned here was the NCUTCD, the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And I'll, I'll tee this up a little bit. When I first read about it, and, and for viewers, I, I was a, a, served on multiple stakeholder committees. I was like, who is this organization and how did they get the authority to write the draft? And does this make sense? Um, so uh, Dong Ho, I'll put it on you because I know you've served on it. Who, who, which, what is this group of people? How did they get this authority? And why did they get to set the rules in the first place? It's to the best of your knowledge. It's a really a dedicated group of uh, professionals and uh, um, stakeholders who come together and uh, look at the METCD, look at research, research needs, and then develop a uh, recommendation to um, FHWA. All decisions, obviously, is made by the FHWA team. Um, and this, uh, 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 the uh, National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices used to have another, a parallel uh, uh, committee that looked at uniform uh, vehicle code as well. Uh, so um, th there was a parallel effort to look at traffic control devices and, and how they're utilized in the United States. And then uh, another uh, group that looked at the laws and regulations. And uh, that group uh, no longer exists, do not, do not meet. And so uh, if you think about how fast things are changing, um, and of course the uh, the makeup of this group uh, is fairly large. There's you know uh, diverse stakeholders, um, and I would say that uh, uh, the the objective of the group is really great. It, uh, we've made uh, a, a tremendous uh, impact in in terms of safety for vehicles and uniformity on our uh, on our roadways. But it doesn't really recognize some of the uh, the needs of outside the vehicle. Again, the place and the uh, uh, the communities, and we're especially seeing this in our uh, uh, in our uh, time right now with COVID, with the uh, the changing need of the street itself. Um, there's no tools that are available except for putting in road close signs in order to allow that space for people to be able to uh, safely distance, right? Um, uh, and then ability for uh, uh, for even uh, being involved in this uh, in this committee to understand how decisions are made uh, at the, uh, the METCD team at the federal level is not very transparent. It's hard to really understand unless um, unless there you know uh, 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 you have a relationship uh, with the uh, uh, with the team. Don Ho, is it all engineers on that committee? Traffic no. engineer. No, there's again there there's a broad uh, uh, stakeholder uh, group, but mostly engineers. Uh, there are there are uh, uh, practitioners. Uh, they are there are uh, lawyers. <laughs> uh, there there are people. Uh, again, there are various different uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, and I, I would say that it's a uh, uh, its strength is having that diversity, so that all issues get. Uh, discussed, we review the uh, all the implications and and have a uh, uh, a robust dialogue. Uh, but uh, again, it uh, uh, really difficult. We had a stakeholder group that looked at just the pedestrian aspect of it. There's a uh, and uh, uh, just the interest in that in that group uh, to further the needs of the pedestrian has been uh, tremendous. Um, and it, it's, it's hard to get uh, get that kind of uh, uh, change, uh, uh, but it doesn't get through the. I mean, it doesn't actually get through the committee. I've seen you tweet about things that are voted down. Zabe, if you were to design a committee to, for road safety, how would you do it? Who would you put on that committee? And and would it, you know, what are the values you'd be looking for on that? I mean, this is this is a great question. Um, I uh, luckily don't have to wave my magic wand. I don't. I don't get to be the person. I think the the goal would be to make sure that it is a multidisciplinary committee 
that there are pedestrian planners, that there are bicycle planners, that there are you know, transit planners, that, that everyone involved in using our streets has a voice on the committee. Um, there's someone in the, the chat who mentioned, you know, does this have a public health framing? You know, are we looking at people who, who realize that, that you know, people shouldn't leave, leave sedentary lives? I mean, I think this is the question and it's, it's part of our call to, to make sure that it's multidisciplinary because streets are used by many different people. And we would need to make sure that both perspectives as well as expertise are diverse on this group because everyone uses the street. And I mean, we talk a lot about designing streets for cars. I, I would even say that we're not doing a great job of designing streets for drivers either. I mean, we think about all of the, the traffic deaths on our streets and that number is climbing every year. And we certainly wanna focus on cyclists and pedestrians and transit riders who are you know, the most vulnerable, they're outside of vehicles. But some of those traffic deaths are drivers as well. And so we need to make sure that we are doing what we can to actually achieve safety, uh, sustainability, and equity. And that means having multiple voices in that at the table. You know, there's another th thing about the, this process that, that struck me, and, and I was an advocate uh, for sidewalks and the like, and my first experience with the MUTCD was being told that something didn't meet the warrants. Um, the warrants, and if you're an advocate, you've heard this phrase, and, and I had to ask, what are the warrants, and where is this? And, and it was these guidelines. And, you know, I'd be interested if somebody wanted to speak to this issue. One of the things that that concerned, well, and so I was a lawyer. I could go figure out what it was. I could go organize my neighborhood to push back. Um, does, does this have a differential impact on communities? Because some communities have the ability to push back against the technical expertise of the planners and other neighborhoods do not. Do we end up with yet an, an equity issue because of the framing of this document as a technical document as opposed to a, you know, a public safety document of some kind? Who wants to take that one? Um, Lisa, so I see you smiling. <laughs> um, I agree with what you're saying. Um, there is a lack of education um, on the part of people that live in communities. And it's not their fault. It's just that it's government. And with everything that you deal with when you get past your local level, it is about education. Um, and that's some of the stuff that we do here in our, um, here in my shop is when there is a no, we do have to do some education to explain why there is a no, that something can't get done to improve safety along the roadway. Um, some people move it up the ladder and it can um, get pushed to a point that it does become a political situation. But yeah. then because of what the MUTCD does and the fact that you have licensed engineers you don't ever want to put anyone's license at risk of violating the MUTCD. And so yeah. it does become a very slippery slope. I think I answered your question. I think you <laughs> did. I think what I heard you say was this document, if you don't follow it, an engineer could lose their license. So even if a community is making a good argument, um, they can't necessarily win, but I thought I also heard you say some neighborhoods manage to elevate it politically and and uh, um, maybe get a little more leeway in the MUTC than other neighborhoods do. Um, this and, was my and I think, it goes, I think it also goes back to what Benjamin said is that if it does get elevated to that point and it gets implemented, like with us, it comes out of the agreement. And you're gonna have to take responsibility liability and risk for what you've installed. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk about that. Matt, maybe you can talk about this issue as well, like that this document has legal effect, that even though it's a guideline, uh, engineers really feel compelled to follow it. And why is that? You're muted still. You gotta, you gotta unmute yourself.
Well, we can, um, I'll tell him a story. Well, he's finding the mute button. I'll tell a little story then, because I've been dying to tell the story. When I was a mayor getting briefed by uh, SDOT at my regular briefings, I actually had somebody from the city attorney's office come in and tell me that all of the city's streets were safe because the city followed the MUTCD, which was the Bible of engineering. So even though my eyes told me and people told me that streets weren't safe, I was uh, admonished not to ever say that because they followed the MUTCD. Um, Matt, wh why, did, why was she so hepped up on telling me that? No, because because um, following the MUTCD was uh, the way that that particular lawyer, the strategy that particular lawyer, but unfortunately a lot of agencies have for avoiding lawsuits or avoiding liability. Um, one of the challenges that cities face in kind of going beyond the MUTCD in solving problems that aren't already um, aren't already solved by a device in the manual um, or applying them to new situations. Um, or even just putting in an unwarranted, I'll put that in, in scare quotes, an unwarranted uh, crossing, um, is that they fear either that they'll have to do it everywhere, which is to some extent a legitimate fear, but also something that really does harm the, the, uh, the systematic response to safety problems and the systematic response to the barriers that pedestrians face on our streets. Um, there's a notion that, well, okay, if we don't do, if we put in a signal, let's say at location A, where we know it doesn't meet the MUTCD warrant um, or any of the, any of those warrants directly, um, uh, but we know it's needed, but then we don't do it at location B and someone gets hurt at location B, we'll get sued for that. So that's one, um, that, and, and could even lose, could, probably won't, probably won't, I should note, uh, and Dang Ho can probably talk more about being in a difficult uh, legal environment. Um, but I think the the thing that we notice is that that fear leads to very disparate outcomes. And it's not, you know, it's not it's not only we talked about how the um, how um, a community or um, or an organization has to be really, uh, really, really well informed and take a lot of time um, and energy and probably money if they're going to kind of go up against a decision that was justified by the MTCD, but also the jurisdictions themselves, cities, towns, states, counties, um, we tend to see a real disparity in how much work they do, the city and how far they go beyond uh, the strictures of the MTCD. Cities that are self-insured, you know, magically tend to go, um, go a lot uh, further um, than cities that are uh, relying on liability insurance. Um, and that's, that's a real inequity. That's a real inequity. Um, you need to have a PE on staff usually if you're going to do that work, right? Um, if you're going to go uh, do something that's uh, even a, a should not clause in the MUTCD, right? FHWA will say that that's, um, you know, that's flexibility. And legally it is flexibility, but it's rarely interpreted as such. You really need your own engineer. It's hard to find, sometimes hard to find a consulting engineer will do that. Um, there are good ones, and it's certainly possible, but that means that you're putting up a barrier really to the people who need it the most, to the towns and cities that need it the most. And remember that we're dealing with a massive problem that on our formerly suburban arterial streets, which off which sometimes are in a big city, sometimes aren't, we have these pretty significant safety issues. That's about half of the pedestrians in the United States are being killed by motor vehicle traffic. That's that's really I just I can't emphasize enough how important it is to see the connection between access to transit on those big streets, the jurisdictions and their own uh, often inability to change what might be a state highway uh, under state code, even though it's a city street or an urban street, an urbanizing street with transit service and people walking and commerce, um, or simply their own um, their own inability to have you know not they don't have as much money um, as some of the cities have done the most work. So I'll just toss this one out to the group. You know, one of the things that we know, you know, one of the things I think that's, you know, troubling to anyone who's been an advocate in this field is this oftentimes commonplace assumption that, well, everybody drives and therefore we have to make it easy to drive. Um, there's a wonderful campaign, advocacy campaign in, in my home state of Washington uh, in which um, 
uh, it's the Disability Mobility Initiative, pointing out that 25% of the public does not have a driver's license, whether due to age or ability um, or choice. Um, and how does the MUTCD, you know, you know, you look at something like, uh, first of all, just the ability to move around your community, but then issues around, say, how long does it take to cross a street before the light starts flashing? To what degree is the MUTCD prioritizing those needs in the process from your experiences working with it? And, and if you were to redraft the MUTCD, what changes would you make in order to really uh, center the needs of uh, those with accessibility issues or older or younger of different uh, abilities? So I'll, I'll, I'll give a comment on that. And it's not just MUTCD, but it's also Highway Capacity Manual and just how traffic studies are done in general. Um, lots of times when uh, bigger agencies like states, counties, or sometimes cities, depending on how big your agency is, when you project out, uh, you know, the 10 years, the 15, the 20 years out to figure out what the capacity of your roadway should be. It's always about uh, the capacity for vehicular drivers, right? Or vehicles, how many vehicles can I have on my roadway? Do I add another lane? Do I add a turn lane? Um, or do I add, uh, you know, just sometimes, some things are being talked about like uh, roads that go over intersections that aren't uh, I-95s or interstates or anything like that. It's just how can you keep the continuous flow of vehicles over conflict points? When we do the traffic studies, we never, we never really, or, or the bigger agencies never really uh, project out the 2020s, the 2030s, 2040s, 2050s of how many more pedestrians or bicyclists you have in your city or just going around uh, the network. So I would actually like to see that, some type of language in the MUTC or Highway Capacity Manual, a methodology of how to generate pedestrian traffic in the future and then have warrants based on your expected pedestrian traffic for these mid-block signalized crossings. Right now, MUTC, uh, I believe their warrants are only uh, of how many pedestrians you count at specific times, you don't, there's no projection of, of future uh, pedestrian uh, or bicycle crossings. I didn't answer all my, my, my little gripe about it. <laughs> no, that, thank you. Dong Ho, you wanted to jump in too, I saw. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, um, I, I would say that the, the METCD, the, the current uh, uh, proposed um, amendment, uh, actually helps with the uh, uh, accommodating pedestrians and, uh, uh, and signals. Um, it, it changed from standard to guidance um, and provides a much more flexibility. So it, it's going in the, in, in the right direction. There's, we also have a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a couple members who are uh, in the uh, uh, advocacy and also uh, design for the uh, access board um, that Help center some of the uh, uh, the design for people who have uh, sight uh, and mobility issues. So you know those are uh, uh, definitely uh, being addressed. But I think uh, as far as like um, uh, you know how what the current current MUTCD and how you know how we are uh, accommodating uh, accommodating for uh, 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 pedestrian needs and uh, projections. That's something that I think each agency. Uh, has to uh, look at holistically uh, in Washington State. Uh, our uh, our state highway uh, uh, department uh, provided uh, City of Seattle some flexibility and said, okay, you know, at this location, you know, there's no uh, no one's going to cross here, but we know there's a demand, so we want you to come up with a plan on how you monitor. Um, and then uh, tell us if it's uh, operating safely. And once that's in place, uh, and if it's not, then you need to provide us the, uh, the uh, a procedure for remedying. Uh, uh. And so uh, we were able to do that for uh, um, uh, a, a location on uh, Highway 99. Uh, we are now doing a couple other additional crossings on uh, Lake City Way, which is uh, 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 a uh, location of similar character, very, very daunting. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that uh, need to be uh, uh, more holistically addressed in METCD so that it's easier for communities to work with their state DOTs and other, uh, other jurisdictions um, so that uh, it can be utilized. Okay, so we're going to go, we're going to keep this conversation going for another, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, as long as we're still having a good one, but it's the top of the hour, so if you have to leave, we understand, 
you should, of course, go to americawalks.org slash donate and support this work. We actually staffed up so that we could do more. So we need more for this. Um, so please do that. Comment. Um, you know, send in your message to the regulatory comment period. It's open through May 14th. You, again, you can go to America Walks. You can go to NACTO. They've got a great page on, on what's allowed and what isn't and, and why you should engage. Um, share some of the uh, materials. We'll follow up. We'll send you in an email some of the stuff that's been written about this. Please share. Uh, get other people involved. Get other more voices in into this discussion. And uh, if, again, if you have to drop off and if you want to stick around, I got a few more questions for folks. Um, um, but first, just a comment, uh, Benjamin, your point. I, I, I've always been struck by the fact that a lot of cities have adopted climate action plans which call for a reduction um, in the amount of driving and an increase in the amount of pedestrians. At the same time, their, their transportation departments have projections of future traffic that must be accommodated. So there's an element both of predicting the future and also shaping the future. So I just wanted to put that into the mix as well, that when you design streets for more cars, you're going to get more cars. When you design them for more pedestrians and, and, and biking, you'll probably, you'll probably get some more. Um, okay, everything that I just said about uh, um, send in your comments, get engaged, get other people engaged, uh, there have been a few questions in the comment thread. And by the way, if you have a detailed question of what is or is not allowed in the MUTCD, we're not going to get to it here, folks. We're sorry. You're just going to have to follow up with your local MUTCD experts, and maybe NACTO can, uh, maybe we can save some of these comments and wade through a little bit. Um, but we've asked the Secretary, uh, Pete, to, but a judge, to reframe and rewrite. Um, and and I, I don't know, I guess I'll come back to Zabe again, because I know you've been a participant in helping shape this strategy. What do we mean when we say reframe? Let's just start with that word. What are we looking for with a reframe? Again, one of the things that we're most interested in is making sure that there are multiple voices at the table, uh, more diverse voices at the table in terms of not just cities and towns and um, perspectives, um, but also you know, expertise and to make sure that, that everyone in, at that table is actually involved in the writing of the document itself. Um, we think that will help to create a document that is not just going through line by line uh, comments and edits, but really looking at the spirit and the goal ultimately of the document um, and where it needs to end up. And, and I think, I hope that, that that is something that's on the table. Um, we certainly see FHWA staff is interested in making sure that we're creating safer streets. We all know that. We, we all talk about it all the time. Um, we want to make sure that the, the document itself has enough flexibility so that we can say, hey, you know, this whole section needs to move to a totally different location. Or we need to have rewrite the entirety of, of section one so that the framing with, with which people read the document starts out in the right place so there there's you know specific things that we can and will comment on where you know as i said we're collecting hundreds of comments and we'll be submitting them as well in addition to our uh, initial letter um but the goal here is to really look at the, the now tens of thousands of comments coming in and instead of saying page by page this is how the document should be reframed for the entire document what is the right you know, framing for it, for what is the right outline, and really try to make sure that that it still, again, meets the spirit of safety, equity, and climate. Well, those are three frames then. Safety, equity, and climate are frames that we could use to reframe. Um, you know, Matt, if you had to pick out three frames or two frames that they're using now, what are the frames that they're using now in the document? Uh, they're really using, um, uh, they're really using um, free-flowing motor vehicle traffic as their as a as a uh, a beyond end all, and I think that it's called mobility, um, but it's not a complete mobility, right? So mobility is in theory the frame, but it's just not a complete mobility. Um, and uh, the other, I think the other key is that they're using uniformity as a frame rather than clarity of communications or fitness to purpose. And most 
um, most engineering guidance, um, most design guidance, you're really providing, um, you're, you're trying to give people the tools that they need to solve problems. METCD is, unfortunately, it's written in a way that makes it ambiguous whether you're allowed to do things beyond it. Um, and so that's, um, that's one of the, you know, there, there are clauses that say things like, um, that say things like, um, uh, just because it's not prohibited doesn't mean it's permitted. Um, but beyond that kind of challenge for the practitioner, for the user, um, there's, um, there's a frame there, the user types, uh, the target user of the manual as proposed. And this is new. I have to tell you, this is new in this manual. Um, it, this edition would make it explicit that only uh, people who are paying attention, uh, who are fully alert and aware, um, who aren't impaired in any way, um, are really the, uh, the users that we should be designing for and engineering for. That's a big, big problem, and that's a, it's really a, the opposite of the safe systems framework. Um, I don't really know what else to call that frame other than the opposite of, of safe systems. If I could follow up um, really briefly on this, I think one of the things that is uh, worrisome at this point is that it, it is seen as a permissive document, right? You can do certain things if you interpret certain sections in certain ways, right? Um, the shall, the should, the should not, all those different things. Um, it creates a, a system where the interpretation is what is most important. And we've heard really different interpretations between cities and states and then across cities and states, right? So, you know, Seattle versus uh, WashDOT, for example, that sort of thing. Um, and if what we're really looking for is a document that is proactive with respect to safety proactive with respect to, to equity, proactive with respect to sustainability, so that we are putting the types of movements and accessibility that we want to see, that we know will accomplish our goals at the forefront, so that it's easy to understand, yes, we want to make this pedestrian crossing safer. Yes, we want to make this you know, bikeway uh, signal safer, things like that, so that it is both easy and sort of straightforward for cities to be able to implement the types of changes that we know they, they already want to do in most cases. And so that they're, they're not as um, time consuming and costly, right? Because the longer it takes for you to do something, the more it's gonna cost the city to get it done. That's the kind of framing that we wanna see. Well, this is interesting because when you talk about framing, you're really starting to get at values. Like, well, what are the underlying values? And I, I, this is something that that kind of uh, finally occurred to me when I was looking at this is that we tend to, you know, when you look at a technical document that's that's taken care of by experts, you tend to have a deference to experts, right? Because they they know the data better, they've done the studies, they they are they've spent more time in the field. But I think what's often neglected in that 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 underlying that expertise is a set of values about what are the appropriate outcomes? And it may not be wise to uh, assign away community values to a select group of people. You may actually want to make sure that the values of the community are heard at the front end. And I was really struck by the, uh, the point you just raised, Matthew, about um, who, the typical user, right? That, that an underlying assumption, an underlying value is that a typical user is you know, fit and aware of their surroundings. Um, I'd be interested, having heard those from anyone else, what other underlying assumptions or values or frames do you think need to be, you know, taken a look at in in terms of what, how this, you know, how this document should be reframed? Well, I think that they should also include the ability for you to live in an area that has a level of livability. If you're unable to walk, ride your bike, take transit, you're in an area that is not safe and to have shared safety because when you have a livability area and a shared safety area that automatically helps to put the groundwork for economic development because everyone is being able to move about if you're on some of these six lane highways it's really hard to get to the other side when you have to and then you have to walk a country mile to get to the next light which makes people cross and jaywalk and they get out there and they're in the middle of the street. And if they get hit, the driver is not even going to get held responsible because they were driving. 
And those are the type of issues that people are dealing with, especially as these suburban areas begin to populate and turn into urban areas. And also in urban areas where that one roadway is the roadway that leads out and in. And you have these mega six lane, eight lane roadway. And, you know, it just, we have to look at how does living in these kind of areas make it safe for people to move about? I think this is an issue that's only getting more important. I mean, it depends on one city, of course, but um, in the cities in which um, the, the popular cities in which people are being pushed further and further, lower income people and immigrant and refugee communities and people of color are being pushed further out into suburban areas and they, be mo they may be most dependent upon the ability to walk or use transit in order to access economic opportunity. Uh, Dong Ho or Benjamin, would you like to weigh in on the framing question? This is a great, great closing segment. Yeah, here, as we, I would uh, say, yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, safe system approach is really important uh, on, on our roadways and that you know that's a, a, a uh, should be a, a core value and then transparency on how decisions are made how people can influence uh, changes right now it's uh, it's, it's very uh, difficult for people to understand and if you know if you are a private property owner or someone who has to abide by this manual uh, but then don't understand how decisions are made uh, and uh, um, uh, the whole process becomes very confusing for people. Benjamin? Yeah, I don't have much to add, but ditto. Um, it's kind of, what's really interesting about uh, MUTCD and transportation, is very similar to technology, right? Technology uh, for two years would be obsolete two years later. So not that MUTCD is an update every two years, but it seems like the way we move around in our cities and our, our transportation network is, is updating rapidly similar to technology. So the, the, the end user is always changing in, in my belief. Okay, so flexibility to adapt to changing circumstances. Okay, well, we've gone uh, 13 minutes over. I really wanna thank all our panelists for joining us. It's you know, I'm, I'll make another editorial comment here. There were some editorial comments embedded in my questions as well, but I'll make an edit. It's, you know, I, I experienced it as an advocate, uh, the MUTCD, I, I experienced it as, as a mayor. And even now in this new role in talking with everybody, I've just learned even yet more how deeply embedded it is in the design of our streets. And I hope I'm not overstating it, but it seems like an extraordinarily significant action that could be taken to make local streets around the country safer, to reframe and rewrite this. Like we're just stuck with an old paradigm. We're stuck with a set of values that isn't consistent with, with our future vision of being equitable and safe and inclusive, you know, and and the economic vitality that that accompanies, you know, great places where people can connect with opportunity and be safe and live full lives with dignity. Like all of this is in, in implicated here. And I've learned a, a, a lot from all of these speakers here and in the conversations I've been having. So I would, again, really strongly urge people to become engaged in this process. Um, one of the beauties of this is that if you follow Washington DC politics, you know that um, it, you, you know, it takes 51 votes to get something through the Senate and the US House of Representatives is closely divided. This is an administrative action. This is within the control of our new uh, US DOT secretary and they have made racial equity a priority. They have uh, raised the issue of uh, that, you know, maybe we can turn some asphalt over to other uses besides moving cars. Um, they, they've really put a stake in the ground that they want to do something good. Here's, this is the chance. This is the chance. So we'd ask you to get engaged. Um, to, to you know, let's see if we can live up to the values we state about what we want to see in the future. And uh, again, um, we really do want you to think about supporting the work that we do, so that we can continue to to partner with uh, our great allies here and keep working to create better better streets for everyone. 
um, safe streets that are open, accessible, equitable, and inclusive. So thank you all for joining us.